This is Heather Montgomery on the 6th of the 8th, 2022, from Anna House, with... Yes, I'm Brian Gallagher, I, and I was reared in the townland of Derry Lynn, and I live in Enniskillen now, and I'm a retired teacher. And I have a number of uh, stories. This is from a well-known storyteller, sadly dead now, from Paddy Cassidy, and this is what he said. There was a custom in our country of fishing with set lines. At night time, you would bait a few hooks on a long line, row out into the middle of the loch, drop it into the water, right down to the bottom, row back and tie the other end of the line to a tree. And in the morning, you would pull the line in and usually you would have caught a few fish. Well, there was a man who lived on the shore of Upper Loch Ern, and he knew that there was a huge pike in the loch. He had tried several times to catch it, but all he got was hooks straightened out and line broken and bait gone, no fish. But he was determined to catch the monster. He went down to the local blacksmith and he got him to make a huge fishing hook out of the iron that he used to make horseshoes. He was a good smith and the hook was a masterpiece. It must have been six, six foot high or more. Now, one of his calves had died and the man decided to use this as his bait. So he got the longest tether rope he had. He stuck the dead calf on the hook and he catched it. He attached it to the rope with a roll of barbed wire, tied the other end of the rope onto a big tree and he rode the whole contraption out to the middle of the loch and he left it there. Next morning he got up and he went down to the shore to see what had happened. The big tree was bent almost in two. There wasn't a leaf left on it and the rope leading into the water was so tight that if you touched it you could hear a musical note. He had no chance at all of pulling the fish out by himself, but the local tug-of-war team were practising for the sports, and he went up to the football field where they were gathered. Would you like a real trial of strength, he said. If you win this, you'll be sure to win at the sports. So down they went to the lock shore. Where's the opposition, said the captain. Look at that rope. Look at the tree. Look at the water. You have to pull a fish out of the loch. If you can't do that, you'll be the laugh of the countryside. Now leave it to us, said the captain. It took them 20 minutes with blistered fingers and weary muscles, but eventually they were exhausted, but had the fish out on dry land. Somebody, Paddy was telling us, somebody would always ask, was it was it really a big fish? And the storyteller would uh, pretend to be angry. I'll not say it was a big fish. I'll not say it was a big fish. But the level of Loch Ern dropped by a foot and a half. And they had to get six low loaders to take it away. And when its head was in listener's key, its tail was only going through Newtown Butler. And that's not all. The scales on that fish slated 12 bungalows and the backbone and the side bones were the rafters for six more. No, I'm not saying for a big fish. And he'd go back and he'd smoke his pipe. Well, there's a kind of a sort of a, a similarity. There, it's the same story, only it's sort of a different, a different place. I was coming back home in the pony and cart, said the storyteller. And I was doing a bit of fencing, and I had a bit of the barbed wire left in the cart when I saw a big line of fishermen all fishing in the Arnie River. As I looked, I saw one by one the fishing rods getting snapped and being pulled down underneath the water. There was a swan 
followed by its young swimming down the river, the young swans, and they're called signals. And one by one, they too were pulled under the water. And last of all, the mother swan disappeared in a flutter of feathers. I formed the idea that there was a big pike in the Arni River and I set to work to catch it. Now, I had in the cart a dead badger that I had picked up on the road and I wrapped the barbed wire around it and then I took the reins off the pony and I tied one end to the shaft of the cart and the other to the dead animal and I led the pony and cart into the field alongside the river and I threw the whole bit into the water. But God, she struck. I backed the pony up and, you know, she was pulled to the very edge of the river with her hoofs sliding through the grass before she got stopped and I managed to haul the pike out of the Arnie River. I'll not say she was a big fish, but the level of the Arnie River dropped by a foot and a half. Now this one, it's about the night of the big wind, or Ihen Gehe Mora in Irish. It was on the 6th of January, 1839, it has gone down in Irish folklore. In Fermanagh and other parts of the country, it was often pronounced the big wine. Now, in 1908, the old age pensioner was introduced for people over the age of 70. One of the questions to establish proof of age was whether the applicant remembered the night of the big wind. In the House of Commons, it was reported that 120% of the population of Ireland could remember it. And it gave rise to a rich crop of folk tales, and here's one from South Fermanagh. There were three men talking about their experiences on that day. And one man said, I was standing at Belnalec Cross when a buyer came down the road from Arnie. It was being blown down, you see, and there was 12 cows loose through it, and there was a woman sitting on the one of them and her milking. And the next man said, that's nothing. I was standing at the door of our house, and a whole field blew past like a big green carpet, and there were seven rooks of the best of good hay on it. And the third man said, yes, they're talking. Well. I had two pecks of hay in the haggard, and when it got up that morning, there was three pecks of hay there, and I went out to look, and there was a man up on top of the new one, and him cutting hay with a hay knife. I asked him, where are you from? And he said, I'm from the county Monaghan. <laughs> now here we go again, this is the big fish. In the early 1900s, there was a man lived near the shore of Upper Loch Erne. He knew there was a big pike in the loch, because every morning he could see this big bow wave going down the loch. Now, he knew there was no chance of him fishing for it, but he had an old-fashioned blunderbuss in the house, and he decided that he would shoot it. Now, he knew there was no chance of him fishing for it, but he had an old, I'm sorry, I'm just repeating myself. He decided he would shoot it. Shall I start again? No, you're fine, just keep going. So he went down to the shore. So he, <laughs> so he went down to the shore and he stuffed the gunpowder down the barrel of the gun. And then he realized that he had no lead shot. It was autumn, and there was a big white thorn hedge growing nearby, covered in haws. So he took a handful of the haws and he rammed them down the barrel. Sure enough, on came the big bow wave. He fired the blunderbuss. The wave seemed to shudder, but carried on down the loch. And that, he thought, was that. But the next spring, he informed everybody that when he looked out, 
he saw a big white horn hedge coming sailing down the loch and washing on it. And if we could just visit it, thank goodness to get away from the fish, this is the big potato. I was digging the spuds one year in the field behind Arney Chapel. It was a good dry field and I had the best of farmyard dung in it. Man, there was a great crop. Every stalk had enough to fill a creel and every spud was big enough to satisfy a hungry man. But then I came across a huge spud. It was so big that I couldn't get it out with a spade and I had to go home to get a crowbar, a big iron bar, and with great difficulty I got it out. And it started to roll down the path alongside the chapel. It was nearly round in shape and it gathered speed out through the gate. And there was a man coming from the bog with a horse and cart and the spud rolled into it with a ferocious crack, broke the wheel to bits, capsized the cart and the poor old horse was left lying on the road, kicking in the harness. I was watching all this, and in the excitement, I let the crowbar fall into the hole. It was so deep that I couldn't see the bottom of it, and I'd lost my crowbar. I got the newspaper the next morning, and there was a big headline, Man Killed by Flying Crowbar in Australia. There was no electricity where I grew up and at night the countryside was dark and apparently thickly populated with ghosts. There was a ghost at the Pound Cross and one at the Stone Depot and one at the Preaching House and there was a house where the door was always open night and day because it was built on a fairy path and if it was closed the house would fall because it would prevent the fairies from going in the front door and out the back. When I was about 11 or 12 years of age, I joined a local dance band, and once a week we had a practice in a house which was three miles distant from my home. And after the practice every night, they would tell ghost stories, usually featuring a black dog which padded beside you in the dark, or a banshee who would wail because someone was about to die. However, one of them, one night, told a story directly to me, and it went like this. One night, my grandfather was coming from the town of Swanbar riding a horse, riding a horse, and when a, a headless horseman rode up beside him, he rode with my grandfather for a couple of hundred yards until they came to a gap in the hedge and he turned round, smiled at my grandfather and disappeared through the gap in the hedge. What do you think of that, he said. Oh, it's pretty scary, I said. Of course he had made a fool out of me and everybody laughed at the idea of a headless horseman being able to smile. Good night now, they all said as I got up to go and safe home. It's that kind of a night. And I went out, got on my bicycle, no lights, pedalling, head down against the wind, my mind full of fear. And halfway home, I heard a snort in the air above me. Yes, in the air above me. I got such a shock that I fell off the bike. And when I looked up, I discovered that the noise had come from a horse standing sideways with its backside to the river or to the I discovered that the noise had come from a horse standing sideways with his tail against the hedge. I had cycled under his neck and he had start, snorted in fear. Well that made two of us I thought as I got shaky on my bike 
and cycled home. Shortly after that incident, electricity came to our area, and as one old man said to me rather sadly, the electric light done away with the ghosts. Police stations along the border in 1940s were known as punishment stations, being so far away from Belfast. Any policeman who misbehaved, usually by drunkenness, was sent there. So there was usually one deviant policeman stationed in our remote barracks. The new police sergeant was a Catholic, the first to be so appointed. Shortly after he arrived, somebody painted the words, No Pope here, on the walls of the barracks. Like a wise policeman, he made discreet inquiries, and he discovered the culprit. Went to his house at six o'clock in the morning and knocked on the door with a blackthorn stick he always carried. The door was cautiously opened by the man in his nightshirt. The sergeant grabbed the front of the nightshirt and said, I want you to remember one thing. I am not the Pope. And that was that. One day, the county inspector arrived unexpectedly. He was a man who struck terror into all and he had received a complaint, an anonymous letter. Pochine was being made in the area and the police were doing nothing about it. At the next petty station, he said, I want to see at least one case appearing in court. Otherwise, there will be the disciplinary action against you. The sergeant duly summoned a man for making potting and took a bottle of the drink as evidence and kept it in the barrack cell. The night before the court case, he went to collect the bottle. It was empty. The contents consumed by the resident police alcoholic. No evidence, no case, problems. The sergeant went to a man who was noted as a potty maker. Do you know, he said, where I might be able to get a bottle of potty? Is it for yourself, sergeant? Said the man. It is. Well, maybe if you call back in a half an hour, I might know a man that might have one. Next day in court, the bottle of potion was produced. The magistrates smelt it, confirmed that it was indeed the illicit liquor, ordered it to be disposed of. The defendant was found guilty. The sergeant pleaded for leniency. It was granted. The man was fined two shillings and sixpence. He was happy, the magistrate was happy, and so was the county inspector. And so was the sergeant, a man who embodied the phrase, act on the spirit and not the letter of the law. I knew him well as I grew up because he was my father. Hey, there's one just more about uh, my father, he used to tell anybody anything. None of the family knew what went on at all. But one day I got an email from a past pupil of mine in America. And he said, he said very wisely, families often don't hear about what happened to their parents. Well, uh, your father, he said, got an, an anonymous letter about a man who was who was making potty and you know when you when you spent uh, when you received an anonymous letter it was the sergeant or the police had definitely to act on it otherwise there would be real trouble so anyway it was this man called curry and uh, he and another the sergeant and another constable came up to see to see to see this man and uh, he, he went up a long lane Now the man happened to see them coming up the lane and he was milking the cows. Now this, is, this happens to be totally true. And uh, he had about three quarters of a bucket of milk and he went into the kitchen and he, he didn't know what to do. 
because there was a bottle of potting hid in the chimney of the of the of the house. So the only place that he could put the milk or the potting was in, into the milk. So he poured it into the milk, and the sergeant came in and the, and he searched all around and no potting at all. So he said, "That's okay, yes." And he was just going out the door when he turned back and he says, "Listen, John," he said, "If you're ever." If you're ever selling that red cow, will you let me know, and I'll buy it off you. He knew. <laughs> he knew all along, yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. but th th there were several things that I could tell you about, maybe just one more about he him. Can. Uh, when you were principal of a school, uh, you were, uh, on election day, you were the presiding officer. And I remember uh, in one case uh, where uh, one of the rules was uh, the presiding officer will display the ballot box empty to all present. So in this particular one in, in Benelec, uh, I opened it and I said, that's empty. And uh, one of the, the unionist representatives walked up to him and said, Oh, that's empty, yes. You know, as if, you know, that I would... Uh, but, uh, however, uh, it was in another house, in, uh, in another uh, election, which was a different story altogether. It was a closed uh, school that had been closed. And when I arrived, for it, it was 6 o'clock in the morning. This was the general election, pardon me. And when I arrived, the place was in darkness, completely complete darkness, nothing, and it was, I remember it was a cold night, or a, and a cold morning, and I was wondering what on earth am I to do, I've got the ballot box and everything here, and next thing a man arrived in a tractor, and uh, he had the key for the school, and uh, he opened it, and he, he had a, a carried behind, in what do you call the thing attached to attach uh, to a tractor uh, trailer tra yes and uh, there was a couple of big stumps of trees in and when I went in he, was, he had hauled these trees out into a sort of a hearth fire uh, that was up and uh, he had next thing he took out a bottle of paraffin oil and he poured it all over it and then he put some turf and he soaked them in the paraffin oil and then finally he lit it and it was a, whew, a big a huge and we had a big fire and after that uh, a few men came in and they were the unionist and the nationalist they represent they were in great form all together and the first thing they did was put on tea and did it would they like tea or anything like that then i said went on to the the the, the, the presiding officer displays the ballot box empty uh, to all present. And what one of the men said, do you take sugar in your tea? And that was the, the state of play. And it was the most enjoyable play that I ever had. Uh, it was a wonderful day because there was all talk about calves and cows and the bog and uh, who lived here and there, and then they got an old roll book that was down, and that was great altogether. And somebody come in to, to, uh, I'd be trying to give them, give them their voting thing, and they, they weren't the slightest bit in interested at all. Don't. And then there was a, uh, a townland called uh, Ahial, and there was about eight different uh, people with the same name, Riley, you know. And they were only named as Riley Mick, you know, or Riley, you know, nicknames just to, to that. And uh, I got all mixed up in the thing that I was, and, uh, and I told them, I said, look, I've done, do you know what you do? He said, they, one of them said, take the pen and just stroke the whole <laughs> lot out, which I duly did. He did. And in, in the middle of all this, uh, my father came in and, uh, he was inspecting that everything was all was all right, you know, in the, in the in the place. But earlier in the day, two or three of the men 
had gone down to the porch and there was a lot of whispering and they headed off up to Ballyconru and they came back with two or three crates of Guinness and uh, this was kept in, in uh, and, and a bottle of whiskey and uh, it was a, a frosty day and you know they, they had just the, the, hot, the hobnail boots on and when the man who was bringing the whiskey and, and stuff back he was just walking in and he slipped with the hobnail boots uh, on, on, the, on the ice and the bottle fell in the porch you know broken altogether and uh, there was a panic of course but they gathered it up all and tidied it and everything and uh, then one of them came up to me very politely and he said uh, would you like something in the tea to warm yourself with you know and I said no no thank you and uh, like I said my father came in shortly afterwards too to uh, inspect that everything and everything was in order. Yes, everything's in order. He said, and he says, your father walked out and then just he stopped in the porch and he turned back and he said, there's a bloody great smell in here, that's one thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that, that was the type of, of, of uh, things. And I, can you switch that off just for one minute? Uh, uh,